just going to start my slides here. All right. Well, yo creo que, um, so Jalito, so a chapa yet Michelle Johnson, Jennings, Michaini, Inki Shopokuna, a chaktasio hoke, the tikpa yako oma ayato. So I would just like to briefly introduce myself as Michelle Johnson Jennings. My Choctaw name is Aina Inki Shopokuna, and I'm from the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. However, my ancestors actually hail from Alba Oma, the place where you gathered the sacred medicines, or today they call that Alabama in the state. Um, before I share with you today, um, I'd first like to acknowledge the land upon which I'm seated. Uh, my background photo is actually my backyard. I'm literally looking out on my backyard right now here on Treaty 6 territory. And I would like to recognize, um, I'm just south of Saskatoon, but I want to recognize the ancestors of these lands and as well as recognize the ancestors that I carry with me and the ancestors that you carry with you today. Before I give a talk, I like to describe who I am as a person, and I had a wonderful intro from Mandy, so I appreciate that. Um, I think overall, though, just to let you know my positionality and where I'm coming from, I am Choctaw, and that's me as a baby on my, my book, my, my grandmother's lap when I was a child, um, and with my older siblings there. And then I'm also with a, a younger grandmother, uh, the lower photo, and then my children are on the, the right side. So I have four children. Um, they span the ages of, I gave birth to my first one and she is 21 now. And then my baby is now four years old. And I hail from the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. You can see that top right photo is the mountains. Um, not very big mountains compared to here by any means, but we, um, we do hold them dear to our hearts. And we play stickball. Um, when the Choctaws were met by the French in the latter 1500s, we would cross our sticks and across. And so we say that's where um, lacrosse came from because that's how we would greet um, when we play. Now, um, although of course it's shared across many nations all across North America as well. Um, I also uh, currently serve as a Canada research chair here in Saskatoon and um, as an indigenous psychologist, however, uh, US trained, However, um, I would like to say really all in all, I think of myself as more of a storyteller. And with that, I just wanna tell you a brief story if I may. So there is the old woman who never dies or Hoyo Ishchizba. And one day she was walking along with Holo. Um, so she was having her moon time and look, see the turtle noticed her. We've known the powerful knowledge and wisdom that women carried and that power is increased. And, and if you, a woman would be so gracious as to step over someone that would impart some of those powers. And looks like I tried and tried and dreamt of getting just a little bit of the knowledge of the ancestors, but you know, never could seem to win Ahoyo Hoshisa's heart. And so as Ahoyo Hoshisa was walking along, looks like slowly crept up to her and tried to hide itself underneath the rocks and around and see if she would happen to step across him. Well, she did. So Loxi moved a little bit closer and Hoyo Shizpa did not step over Loxi. So finally, Loxi became very impatient and tried to creep underneath her skirt as she walked. Well, with that, she raised her foot and came to step and crush his shell to pieces. But Lukti cried out and said, oh, please, 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 please don't crush me, please. I, oh, I didn't mean to disrespect you. I just wanted a little bit of your knowledge. Please, please forgive me. So she stopped crushing his shell just a bit and took pity. She thought about it and said, okay, Luxi, I will grant you the privilege to carry some of women's sacred knowledge. However, this does not come without cost. And in return, you will have to go back. Well, look, they gratefully agreed to this. And so Hoyo Chispa called the Shanini, the ants, to come and fix the shell. To fix it back in 13 lunar months and 28 calendar days upon the shoots. 
And she explained to Luxi that the moon cycle was relegated to women along with sacred knowledge that guided the plants and the power of holo or life. And holo and talked about this love, this women's love that connects past, present, and future generations. But in return, Luxi would have to sacrifice a shell and all the generations forward for the women to use during their sacred corn ceremonies. And Luxi was very grateful and honored to assist. Now, I tell you this story because for one, it creates space within our discussions around psychology for indigenous knowledges. And I do this, especially when I do academic talks because it's very important to create space for indigenous ways and wisdoms. And then for two, all of these stories that I've been told as a child, I didn't realize it until I got older and started reflecting, but they really hold our indigenous health frameworks for well-being. And you can see in that story, Luxi is a bit mischievous. And so when I think about my kids, and I often tell the story to my children, you know, I often try to remember that if they are being mischievous or acting out or doing something that they're not supposed to, maybe it's just that they want to be a part. They want to be a part of something larger. And we have to take time to recognize this, right? And create a space for them. Because, you know, we know there's a, that that's important for children as well. But we also know there's interrelationships with nature. We have certain responsibilities and obligations. Um, the ants help out, there are relatives in our kin, and our ancestors have these instructions for health and well being. We also know women's medicine is very powerful. Women are very sacred, mothers are very sacred. And, you know, I have great discussions with my, my sons about this, as well as with um, my daughters about how, you know, they hold gifts and they can be quite powerful. But as well, our teachings require sacrifice. So if we ask for something, if we sacrifice and receive a gift, then we know that we have to focus on that balance within nature and, and we have to behave accordingly. And this is where we really um, speak a lot about our responsibilities and the knowledges that we carry and our ways of being and interacting within the world. Now, a, a clinical health psychologist trained in the US model in particular, um, I would go into an exam room and the first thing out of my mouth or in a client room would be, instead of focusing on what ancestral gifts you have, it would be, what have your ancestors cursed you with? You know, they give you a risk for a mental health disorder, did they give you a risk for diabetes? Um, what else did they do to you? And that's very different than stopping and looking at it from an indigenous perspective of saying, what did your ancestors bless you with? What are the strengths and sources of resilience that you bring with you? And I think as we look at psychology in particular and working with indigenous families and communities, we need to be very aware of that duality and about um, not necessarily always recognizing the strengths that someone brings into the room with them. Now within that, there's been a lot of talk, especially here of late around indigenous psychologists and around decolonizing psychology. And um, that makes sense to me. This is one of our ancestral drawings that's on a shell of ours. And I think this relates to psychology in particular. I mean, in psychology, you know, the psyche is breath, is the principle of life and soul. And then logia in Greek, you know, it means speech, word or reason. So really we're talking about your life, your soul, your reason, which resonates with me as an indigenous person and in my upbringing. And then also psychology actually has a lot of background within indigenous knowledges that I think gets overlooked and outright um, appropriated early on. And I'll talk a little bit about these just briefly. But there's been a lot of work around Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And in particular, the Blackfoot Nation is reclaiming their information around this. Maslow, you can see the photo. That's actually a picture of him taking off to go to the res reservation, to the reserve. And um, Maslow in 1938 hung out for about eight weeks with the community, was taught about their perspectives, and then went back in 1943 and wrote it up. So you can see there is some overlap. However, the Blackfoot Nation also says he got a lot wrong. And it's really interesting because there's been more and more work around this. I remember, um, I believe it was Leroy Little Bear, uh, whom I met and he was director at the time of the program I was in. 
And he started talking about how Maslow had taken some of this information, right? And then, you know, more and more people have looked into this back in the 90s. And then as it's become more and more um, recognized that it was appropriated from the Blackfoot Nation, um, there has been some backlash of people trying to discount that, which is I'll talk about a little bit more. Young as well is actually based on indigenous thoughts, uh, the whole dream theory work. And Young was very, um, actually, to Young's credit, Young actually recognized that his theories around dreams and psychology came from um, indigenous people. So, the, so I will definitely um, am happy to see that at times because oftentimes it is overlooked. Um, but the Pueblo people who talked to Young really, um, as well as Siouan people, um, really formed a lot of that foundation. And then Eric Erickson in particular for identity development. So indigenous nations across North America had a time period of adolescence. So as you may be aware already, um, there was not adulthood right away. There was encouragement for teenagers to explore, to have relationships. Um, and they wouldn't take on full adult roles until their 20s and often not have children because we had forms of birth control across North America until their 20s as well. So they wouldn't become parents until then. Well, when Eric Erickson went to the Oglala Pine Ridge um, Reserve in 1920s and also spent some time with the Yurok, um, he as well saw this and incorporated it into his theories of identity development and adolescence. And then I also like to throw on my Choctaw um, culture because well-being or the word okay actually came from the Choctaw Nation as well. So we, back in the Battle of New Orleans, Jackson and the traders um, were working with some of our Choctaw chiefs who used the word okay, and um, which means what it means from our language. And that got incorporated from there on in. But it's really interesting because as um, we see Maslow's theory, we see the word okay even, um, even though it's commonplace that it came from a, a nation, there is a backlash that will occur, especially within psychology of people trying to disprove that it came from these places. And a lot of discussion centers around that being systemic racism in psychology and in society as well. As trying to discredit indigenous knowledges as not being um, um, valid enough to have been incorporated within a Western knowledge system. So, a lot of work I do as well centers around the systemic racism. In 1926, there was a lot of work done around indigenous children being feeble-minded. And with this feeble-mindedness, it was used to justify um, a lot of um, taking away children and sterilization as well. So basically it was seen as a moral defect. Uh, Terman developed the Stanford Binet test because the, one of the intent was to actually have children removed from their communities through doing IQ tests on them. So um, you can see why some indigenous families communities are against IQ testing. This wasn't very long ago. My grandparents you know, were alive in the 1920s. As well as you know, eugenics was also um, utilized against indigenous people through the term of being feeble-minded. And the idea was that once you were determined to be feeble-minded through some of these IQ testing, which were culturally inappropriate, and again, were developed in order to um, term indigenous people as feeble-minded to remove children from the homes, um, you could then sterilize the women. Now this definitely occurred within the US. Um, I, I can't think of actually an older relative who you know, didn't have some type of sterilization um, that occurred upon them. And then as well as, as in Canada, it also happened to the Sexual Sterilization Act in Alberta. There were 3,000 people sterilized. They say, you know, upwards of 25% were Indigenous women in particular, happened in BC and across Canada as well. Now, when you have feeble-mindedness and it was utilized and weaponized in such a way through psychology, again, you can see why there could be vast distrust from Indigenous communities towards psychologists but also it then evolved into the term a minimal brain dysfunction. And this is applied to indigenous children. And basically this was the beginnings of ADD or ADHD diagnoses. In the 1970s, um, psychiatrists, researchers would give teachers checklists to rate children's behavior. 
and began theorizing between brain or genetic defects, distractibility, hyperactivity, and delinquency. Now this went on to become what we now call ADHD. And it's become a neurodevelopmental disorder instead of um, being anything to do with the environment or cross-cultural differences with learning or approaches to learning. Now, 11% of indigenous children in the US are labeled as ADHD, which is much higher than any racial ethnic group, um, as well as in particular indigenous boys. And in Canada, we see similar results, although it's harder to get data, I find in Canada than in the US. But it's steadily increased. Um, now other racial ethnic groups are starting to catch up as we increase the diagnoses. So with that, you can see again why there may be um, differences or uh, distrust with psychology within indigenous communities and with indigenous families. Um, you know, we know in Canada that 4% of the current population is indigenous. There are 600 different bands, 55 different languages. Um, we know that diabetes is higher, obesity is higher, but I want to just emphasize though as well that the majority of indigenous families, and that includes youth and adults, actually rate themselves as healthy, both physically and mentally. And though they have higher risk of trauma, poverty, racism, and discrimination, including a lot of systemic discrimination, um, as well as greater depressive symptoms, nine times more, than other racial ethnic groups, as well as anxiety, the majority are also non-drinkers. Um, and that's compared to non-Indigenous people in Canada. So 31% are more likely not to drink. Uh, and that also goes for other substance use. And that also goes towards youth. So a lot of youth um, also are less likely to use substances. Though I don't have like specific percentages on that here in Canada. But I, I do wanna remind you as we talk about Indigenous people, um, overall, there are a majority healthy, vibrant communities. Now, suicide continues to be a major factor um, and a really, you know, I know it's affected my personal family. It's affected lots of families that I work with. And it's five to eight times more likely here in Canada among indigenous youth and as well as the leading cause of death. However, what we do know is that prevention is key and in communities that are able to continue their culture, to have self-governance, um, have land claims, and control their education and health services, as well as their cultural facilities, we see less suicide. And in fact, the First Nations Mental Wellness Continuum Framework has developed a model here. You can see it in the upper left-hand corner about you know, what it means to integrate some culture uh, as prevention and culture for healing and wholeness. Now, a lot of people will ask me as well, well, why do you have higher suicide rates? And um, a lot of the work I've done actually goes directly back to historical trauma and communities where you can see some of these factors that have, are not, cultural continuity is not as plentiful or able to be done by communities is really because the community has been disrupted by large scale trauma. And now this is not just trauma on one family or, you know, which is, horrible to hear about, but this is actually multiple people within your community going through the trauma at one time. And when you have this happen, whether it's indigenous or non-indigenous, we see this as well as with the Dutch famine, um, with the Irish potato famine, you'll see that you get historical trauma responses that are passed on intergenerationally. And this includes a constellation of features. Maria Braveheart talked about this from the 1990s and still it leaves a lot of work around this. And basically what I see it as is a disruption to connection to mother earth and to culture which is healing such as our ceremonies and wise practices. And this disruption was intentional. So it wasn't that you just had a war or people just wanted one particular spot of land and something happened. Um, it was actually systematic and that when indigenous people were a threat to settlers or um, other nations who are trying to settle North America, then there were genocidal attacks that sought to kill out um, as many indigenous people as possible. And that would be our massacres, warfare, smallpox, illegal sterilization, which is still happening today in many communities. 
as well as when um, they wanted to remove them from the land. So this would be the land dispossession. Uh, illegalization of healing practices in the States went on to 1978 as well, as starvation as a tactic, which happened in both the US and Canada. So lots of overlap. The governments actually learned from each other and different tactics of how to handle indigenous people. And then you had assimilation policies. Once indigenous people were no longer seen as a physical threat, then the threat became to actually um, commit ethnocide in the terms of um, eliminating their culture. And this would include your, your land and food trauma and as well as gardening and how to garden from a non-indigenous way or taking away the ability to collectively garden or, or produce. Now, when you have this historical trauma, we know that before the age of five, present trauma will actually compound those effects on an individual. So you have these historical trauma responses, but then if someone has a traumatic childhood, as most of you know, you're going to have an increase of risks even more. You're going to have increased risk for addictions and increased risk for mental health disorders and increased risk um, for obesity, for diabetes. I mean, it really affects the whole person. But we also know that loving, supportive environments and connections can actually reduce these risks as well as culture, ceremonies, medicines. Um, in families in which twins have been separated, again, this is uh, for all humans, um, we're seeing this, not just indigenous people, but you will see that a child who goes to a less, support, less supportive, loving parenting household before the age of five will actually have these phenotypic sw switches turned on in their body. It's not genetic. Um, defects or anything along those lines. It's nothing genetic. It's just actually switches get turned on that make them more at risk for addiction. But the child who's separated at birth that goes to a loving parenting household, those switches get turned off. So those switches relate to, again, diabetes, to how we react to stress, to obesity, to mental health disorders, as well as um, addictions. So this is great news that we can really affect and we can heal and turn those switches off if we have a loving, strong, supportive foundation for children. Um, as well as there's some work around inherited memory. Um, of course, these are our indigenous stories, right? So um, we know that if a, a person experiences mass trauma that you can pass on those memories um, through subsequent generations. And they're seeing the same thing among mice. Like if they shock them when they smell a certain smell, they will actually pass that on to their offspring to avoid that smell or that food item. And so again, Western science is just catching up in my opinion to what our indigenous ancestors have always known. And so when, as a psychologist, I actually work towards transforming that trauma. And in order to reinvent approaches to transfer trauma into love and to really draw from our ancestral practices on the land and to see how we can heal now land holds a lot of promise for healing. And, and again, this is for indigenous families and children, but as well for all. Um, Western science is catching up and, and just uh, reinforcing what our indigenous teachings say about the land and how important it is for us to touch the earth. I know when I first had children, I made these beautiful moccasins and beaded them and put a lot of time and effort into them. Um, and then my spouse who's also indigenous said, okay, so now you have to cut a hole in it. And he's on Anishinaabe. And I was like, um, why am I cutting a hole in these wonderful moccasins I just made? He said, well, a child has to always touch Mother Earth. I was like, okay. And as I, I went along and, and met with my elders more, they agreed. They said, you know, when you touch Mother Earth, it heals you. And it's very important for a child to always be grounded with their first mother. And as Western science, again, is catching up, they're seeing that it does actually alter the chemicals in your brain when you touch the ground. Um, it actually improves your immunity. It lowers your glucose levels. It decreases your stress cortisol. Uh, actually, if you're outside right now, you're more likely to remember what I'm saying. And so there's been lots of research done around, you're actually more likely to have long-term behavioral changes if you take um, a client or patient outside and, and discuss their health behaviors and what changes might be good to make. Um, and of course, from an indigenous perspective, it's reconnecting with our mother which is very critical and important for healing. Overall, land is thriving and well-being. 
So again, the kind of work I do, I work with youth as well as uh, mothers and families around um, what kind of ancestor did their ancestors envision them to be? I often ask these questions in any health intervention that I do, but it's also questions that I ask when just doing um, talk therapy, right? And, and restoring or re-narrating instead of just focusing on the trauma or focusing on uh, what their risks are right now, we focus on, you know, what strengths do they have currently and what kind of ancestors do they want to become in the future? Because we're all future ancestors in the making. And I think that's been the most powerful thing in my line of work of working with youth is that they, they want to know what kind of ancestors um, they can become and, and how they can reach that goal, right? And then what kind of ancestors do you want the future generations to become? So again, looking at those future ancestors and how we can help nourish that in our daily behaviors and our interactions today. And then um, I think restoring is possible. And I think that's through letting indigenous communities drive that process, right? So I, so I just saw a question pop up around, you know, can a Westerner or settler help encourage um, land-based healing? But, but I think, you know, it's about the community. It's about working with elders and leaders in the community to not center the trauma. And this is actually a quote from one of my research projects I'm working with um, indigenous mother and families. And, you know, they said, when you continue to center the trauma, because there's been lots of trauma, you continue to center the colonizer and the colonizing process. So if we just focus on the trauma alone, that's what we're doing. But instead, what we want to do is work with indigenous communities around refocusing on the strengths. What are those ancestral practices that have been passed on? That's one of my, that's my youngest one there. Um, insisted on smudging every day since he was one year old one-year-old, that's his thing, his ancestral practice that he wanted to do. And so, um, you know, it's those type of activities that we can promote and we can encourage. Outside on the land's even more important to do, right? And, and so then we start focusing on what did our ancestors do when they went through that trauma? What got them through the trauma? What was the strength that they passed on to us? And for me and my family, as a trauma that our relatives went through, they did smudging and they passed that on to us as a way to heal. Now, when I say land-based healing, I just want to clarify, I'm talking about reconnecting to the land and centering the land in the healing process or when we do a healing intervention. And that could just be a discussion outside. But um, part of my work is going to ancestral sacred places with youth and families and having time to talk through those ancestral strengths and get back in touch with that or rewalking those removal routes. So the bottom photo is um, a group of women and youth, we went on a, a rewalking of how um, not only just the sites of trauma, but also the sacred sites that the community no longer had access to. And the community instigated new relationships with those sites. And part of that was seeing, you know, land and bodies ancestral place. But as well, it also facilitates reflection and behavioral changes. So every time I go outside with a group of youth or, or women, what we find is that um, there's lots of discussion around mindfulness and a feeling connected and taking time out to reflect on their current health behaviors and what they want to change, but also feeling at ease. Um, it also builds kinship. And so we see ourselves as part of a larger whole, as part of a collective. And as well as we think about health as a long-term journey instead of a quick fix. So it's not about, um, you know, I can't really focus right now. I need a medication. It's about what's your long-term journey and, and how can you make these little changes within your life to reconnect and to rebalance and have this relational restoration. Now, part of the work I do is also um, narrative reactive therapy is what I term it. Um, it's about narrative transformation. So again, you know, we go to these sites where that's um, one of our Choctaw drawings of our Choctaw relatives and some of their words on the left. And we had to rewalk, um, well, we had to walk a trail of tears in which they removed Choctaw people from all across the lower part of the Southeastern US. We we're the first ones to be removed and when they call it now uh, the trail of tears. Actually our chief Nitakechi, I uh, was asked how it was going because we had thousands upon thousands of deaths and starvation and killed at the hands of soldiers. He called it just a, a trail of tears. 
and um, that name stuck. And then they then removed subsequent tribes after us along the same routes and paths. Um, within this though, our relatives would talk to reporters and wrote quite prolifically about their experiences. I mean, it was only the late 1800s, which was for me only six generations ago. And for my daughter is on the right side, it's only seven generations ago. And so um, as we go along these places, again, we focus not on the trauma that they endured to refill that in any way, but we actually focus on what did they say? And we look at the oral histories. And what we find is that almost every time they focus on the love seven generations forward. And they focus on what got them through walking barefoot in the snow or carrying like one of my ancestors carried one of um, their brothers on their back. The brother was four, she was nine and walked barefoot in the snow. And the only thing that kept her moving was the love of his seven generations forward. And I think, wow, that's my children. And that love got her through. And she knew if she put him down, he wouldn't make it, that the soldiers would kill him. So she, she did this and she wrote about it. And it wasn't that the writing of the trauma, it was the writing of the love that got her through this. So that to me is a new way to conceptualize that trauma and that love. And then as for my daughter who went on our first pilot study with us, she actually put it into words more eloquently. And she said, you know, um, I carry that love with me. They loved me so much today that everything I do right now, I have to think about them. I don't have the opportunity to go off and party. I don't have the opportunity to do all this because um, for one, I don't want to, but for two, I'd be letting them down and they love me so much. I have to keep going forward. And that's what she carries with her now. She's um, going into grad school and she still holds very dear to that experience of learning that on the land though and really taking that to heart. And I've seen that time and time again with the youth as we go outside and talk about um, the trauma that they still carry today, like it's present day, but also what got them through and that strength that carries them forward and what that instills a sense of responsibility in them that they then feel obligated to not only care for themselves, but to care for the community and the subsequent generations. So uh, I've done some of this work across um, Canada, you know, North America, basically, as well as Aotearoa or New Zealand. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a similar story each time, right? Uh, the land is figures so prominently within health and well-being. It really is a relationship. It really is a place that you can re refocus and get back in touch, as well as to heal. And that's really critical for a lot of Indigenous youth and families. And it's really about that love. It's about that holo. It's about that love that's a deeper than just a, a partner love, right? It's the love of the past, present, and future generations. And it's about loving yourself and loving the future generations. And I think a lot of times we talk about trauma and, and I always laugh because sometimes I'll have clinicians ask me, well, you talk about love and being healing, but how do you define love? And I said, well, we talk about trauma, but how do you define trauma? I mean, you know it when you feel it, right? And so for Indigenous youth, they as well know it when they feel it. And so that's where I feel like as a psychologist, that's my role is to help them get back in touch with that love and to, to know it and to actually feel it outside on the earth. And when we're able to reconnect with that ancestral love and that ancestral place, we're able to induce shifts, right? Um, because it's about thinking about how our ancestors envisioned us and what they believe for us and want for us in the future. And the struggles they went through would be in vain if we um, don't take that love and pass it on to the future generation. I think as well as we talk about this, um, land-based healing has to be a uh, community healing, right? So we, we help, I do a bit of motivational interviewing, but really it's what my grandmother taught me and how she spoke to me, you know, as a child, like, oh, did you hear about so-and-so was, you know, caught smoking or something at school? It's like, oh, no, I didn't hear that. Oh, yeah. Um, like, that's terrible. And the next time I know, she'd talk to me like, so, you know, what do you think about that? I'm like, oh, well, no, I, you know, smoking's bad. You know, it hurt my lungs or whatever else. I wouldn't do it. Oh, okay. You know, you know, um, so those type of conversations or about if I've talked to so-and-so about something that may have happened and, and what would I do about it, right? So that's to me how I utilize motivational interviewing, especially when I talk with youth about this, but I also use a lot of storytelling. Um, 
when I work with youth and communities, we discuss what are some stories that you know, or maybe read a story together and talk about, well, what do you think that means? What does that mean to you? And especially when we're outside, you know, how does that connect to your life and what you're going through? Um, and I always find those are very important. I think it has great utility for practice. I mean, again, just getting outside, even if you're just going to do um, talk therapy or if it's really, um, you know, we know that depression, for instance, when there's there's been research studies, when people have been hospitalized for depression, going outside for 20 minutes a day has been shown to increase um, the serotonin in the brain, right? Just as much as um, I think SSRIs, so medication. So just getting outside 20 minutes a day could be quite effective. And then if you couple that with talk therapy and talking about the narrative around yourself and healing and, and what are your strengths and resilience, then I think that could be very useful for practice. But as well as mindfulness, there's a lot of work. You know, it's really great that um, the, the stress curriculum that we just heard about, right? I think that's really important to consider because a lot of that, I think, goes back to this reflection of how are we in the moment? And, and Strong Minds, Strong Kids has a great curriculum um, that discusses this. And as well, just being outside can elicit that mindfulness behavior, that stopping to reflect, not having all of those stressors. And then there's some discussion around dosage. I mean, how much is enough? You know, is it just getting outside and touching the earth 20 minutes a day? Or, you know, are land-based healing camps really effective? And how can we work as practitioners with communities to help support those? There's lots of grassroots initiatives. Lots of communities are doing um, healing camps on the earth. And we see that's so effective for the youth in particular. It lowers suicidality, it increases strength and resilience. And how can we help and support that? I think that's a critical question we should be asking ourselves as clinicians. And then even as parents, you know, how do we make time for that? I think about myself with my four kiddos and each time I had these dreams of always being outside and, and, and you know, being out of the land and going to language camps and what have you. But, you know, in reality, a lot of work ha has to be done and we get caught up in our daily lives. And one thing I'm grateful for the pandemic is we've been able to get outside a lot more and to disconnect and not going into work nine to five. And I've had the luxury and very privileged to be working from home with my kids. And so that's facilitated a lot of that. But how do we keep that going? Because we know it's so important for children. I think overall, uh, as we think about um, thrive-ins and transforming narratives of trauma, uh, again, I think we have to consider place. You know, are we working with families in a sterile clinical setting? And what does that do? It, you know, is that the proper place to be? And how hard is it, or would it be just to walk outside and to meet? Um, we also have to think about psychology transformed through indigenous lenses. I mean, psychology is really based on a lot of indigenous principles. And I think as psychologists, we have to recognize that and to give value to indigenous knowledges and wisdom and help let that guide our sessions and our approaches. Of course, Mother Earth is really important within all of that. And as well as recognizing the ancestors that we carry with us today, but as well as you know, our clients bring in with them and the children bring in with them. Now, I just wanted to end on, on my spoke knee, one of her teachings. And um, this is one of my great grandmothers and um, my, my more recent grandmother used to speak about this as well. But when I was a child, you know, I talk incessantly and I was diagnosed with ADHD early on. And um, my grandmother though, what she would do is uh, stop and, and ask me to stop and take a look outside. And it, usually we were in the car or outside and she would just ask me, what do you see? You know, what color is it? Sometimes I say, oh, green leaf. No, no, no. What color is it? I had to describe that color in detail and talk about how it differed from the other colors of green. You know, what shade, what hue? And then I had to stop and listen. She said, listen, what do you hear? What pitch? What sound? What other sounds do you hear? And then how do you feel? She'd ask me, you know, survey it. How's your heart? How's your breath? How's your mind right now? And this is something she taught me to do early on. And I, I, I didn't realize how 
big a difference that made in my life. There's that simple exercise of stopping and being present in the moment. And with that, I just want to say a huge yoko okay. Thank you. Um, and just kind of open it up to questions. I see there's a few questions here. Thanks, okay. Michelle. This is really wonderful. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to, to share that I was really struck with uh, that question around what kind of ancestor do I want to become? I mean, it hit me. It, it like it landed on my chest in such a a powerful way. So I, I, I just, I want to thank you so much for, for bringing that uh, to me and, uh, and I'll certainly be doing some reflection on that. Um, we do have a couple of questions. I, I see that uh, in our Q and A and, and uh, we've also got some questions from previously. Um, and uh, I wonder if we can maybe uh, try to answer as many as we can. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do, but just off the top, Michelle, I'm just wondering, I mean, you've just introduced some really incredible practices uh, land-based healing, going out and touching the earth, storytelling, uh, reconnecting with our ancestors. I'm wondering um, your sort of recommendations as far as integrating perhaps some of those practices in a good way, especially from the, you know, from the top of your, your conversation, you talked about um, uh, cultural appropriation. And so just how would a, a sort of a Westerner kind of uh, integrate some of these practices in a way that, uh, you know, is, is also honoring and respecting uh, culture? Well, I think that's a great question. I, I mean, and, you know, I talked about um, dosage and turn, yeah, in terms of land reference. So how much being outside is important and really any human needs to be outside, right? So again, we see Western science catching up and say, oh yeah, you go outside, it actually increases the neurochemicals in your brain to feel good. Serotonin and neurotin go up, great or your immunity improves to go outside. It's really important during the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think as practitioners, um, even if, you know, I'm indigenous, but I'm not indigenous to different indigenous cultures, right? So um, I, I try to be very respectful of how they want to approach that. If I'm working with a family or community, I say, would it be appropriate um, to spend time outside? Can we talk outside right now? I mean, even that, little movement can actually um, cause significant change for their overall well-being and body. So I think we could start with little things of saying, let's meet outside in the patio. Um, let's go for a walk while we're talking. So those are simple things we can do, but also giving space, right? Is there a story about being outside you'd like to talk about? Uh, it could be a family story. It could be an ancestral story. Um, providing room for that, you know, and if, if you're working with an individual who doesn't know some of their stories because they've been removed from their homes, they've been adopted out or what have you, say, would you like me to help you find some? You know, those are simple things we can do. Look up online. Almost anything's on, available online now. <laughs> so I spent hours trying to find different stories online or connecting with elders are really important. I think that's the number one thing I do when I work with communities. Say, who are some elders that you trust and that I could speak with? And then um, providing space for elders and letting them be as involved as they would like to as well um, with, it, with what you do and your approaches and uh, what would be appropriate or not appropriate. Right. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, just looking at some of the questions, we've got one um, related to um, from the beginning of the conversation about ADHD diagnoses. Wondering if you can speak a little bit more uh, to the factors that might lead to um, Indigenous boys being given that diagnosis at a higher rate. Yes, well, well, I think some of the factors are similar to Western um, um, males in particular, you, you know, just being over-diagnosed with ADHD. And part of that is because when you have hyperactivity, it tends to be noticed a lot more often, especially from teachers early on. Mm -hmm. um, so that would lead to higher diagnoses. Whereas with females, oftentimes we're socialized to be able to sit still from early on, right? It's, it's sometimes more accepted that boys are going to be rambunctious, right? So sometimes that's accepted until they get into the school area and then they'll say they're too distractible. And then um, females will often be overlooked even though they're not quite engaged right, during the process. So that's part of it. But also um, what we find in studies with teachers in particular is that those, um, they call it brown males. Uh, so a child who looks visibly phenotypically darker in a classroom is actually um, called on more for acting out than other children in the classroom. That includes um, brown females as well. So 
um, they would be in trouble more often, they would be um, targeted more often, there may be a or particularly for males and indigenous males as they go through. And you'll see many more indigenous females in academia or with higher degrees. And there's been some um, theorizing that's because the indigenous males are targeted so early on they get um, streamlined out, right? Whereas as females we're seen as less threatening and we're able to keep going through. Right. So it's, it's uh, once again, sort of we, we understand that those labels from a very early age can follow people throughout their lifetimes. Um, so how important it is to, to really consider that as we're working with young people. Um, some other questions as far as thinking about, um, I'm curious about your approach and what, what would it be with kids who felt they were neglected by their ancestors? Oh, I think Michelle, can you hear me? I think you've just frozen. Okay. Yeah. So um, hopefully this is just a, a, a glitch, and uh, and we'll be back on track. I think we we just had that before. Oh, and she might come back to join us. Just re-enter. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for all of your comments and for your questions. I don't think we're going to get to everybody today, um, but certainly we'll do our very best uh, to answer um, afterwards and. Uh, um, here we go. Hi, job. <laughs> Great, you're back. <laughs> the wonders of technology. I know it's, it's been this yeah. kind of day. It must be a full moon or something. You know. <laughs> um, sorry about that. So um, I was just going to say. So yeah. So you do have some who feel like some of their ancestors have been um, neglectful of them in their past. Had lots of trauma, and we do work with families who have gone through a lot of trauma. Have very traumatic. And part of that comes from the residential schools uh, learning abuse that's been passed on in their families. But what we actually do is go back before that, right? So we, we go back to the ancestors before that time period and say, what were the original instructions? What were those original teachings that may have been interrupted due to that trauma? And then we go back to those strengths and, and others who may have also endured and, and had certain strengths they're able to, to pass on. Right focusing on those gifts and, and the resilience. Uh, I love that. Um, it's, it's so powerful. Looking at a couple more questions. Um, uh, can you share more about the benefits of group-based therapy versus a more Western focus on individual therapy coming from an in, in Indigenous perspective? Well, I think group-based therapy is wonderful. Um, so when I was going through my clinical training, I was trained as an integrated primary care psychologist, and I worked in an Indigenous health clinic. Oh, no. We've lost you again. Hopefully Michelle will come back and, and we'll get to this last question, I think, but just wanted to take this opportunity and thank everyone for being with us today. Uh, you will be receiving the recording and, and the slides. And uh, if you've got feedback, please share it with us. Um, we'll be sending out a survey because we'd love to hear what you thought uh, and certainly uh, topics for the future. Um, and uh, just also wanna thank uh, Dr. Michelle Johnson Jennings for sharing with us today. I know I'll wait for her to come back on so I can say that live, but just wanted to acknowledge if folks need to head out. Um, we have uh, just come past one o'clock um, so um, just thank you for your time today. And uh, for more information on our programs, check out our website, www.strongmindstrongkids.org. And hopefully we'll see Dr. Michelle again. Thanks everyone, have a great afternoon. Enjoy the day wherever, wherever the day takes you. I know I'm gonna go outside. 
immediately <laughs> uh, to get my feet onto the ground. So I hope that you're gonna do something like that today too. And uh, really appreciate uh, our psychologists who come on and provide this kind of information and through our webinars, they're, they're all offered free of charge. So these are volunteer psychologists who come on. And so just uh, really wanna acknowledge that, the time that they've spent. And if you're interested in uh, other webinars that we've had, we have a whole library. So check out our website. Um, we've got some really interesting uh, webinars, including information on sleep, grief, um, how to connect with your baby, uh, prenatal attachment and bonding, this kind of thing. So um, please feel free to check that out. I wonder if we've come to the end. We'll take your questions and save them and see if we can perhaps have a written response. Um, but once again, thank you everyone for joining us. Miigwech. Michelle, much appreciated. And uh, to everyone else, have a wonderful day. Thank you.